Hello everyone, welcome back. Today we'll be getting into part 12 of Wagging the Moondoggy by Dave McGowan. Let's jump right in. As launch windows open and close, the next missions move forward. Two test flights on the lunar landing vehicle and then the proposed landing on the moon. And plans are in the making now which include flybys of other planets, visits to what Dr. Bunch calls neighbors. From Debrief, Apollo 8, a NASA promotional film circa 1968. Just a few weeks ago, NASA Administrator Charlie Bolden boldly unveiled the agency's new vision. Imagine trips to Mars that take weeks instead of nearly a year. People fanning out across the inner solar system, exploring the Moon, asteroids, and Mars nearly simultaneously in a steady stream of firsts. As quoted from launching a broader vision for NASA, Los Angeles Times, February 2, 2010, Bolden's ambitious proclamation was intended to put a positive spin on NASA's acknowledgement that the Constellation program, which taxpayers have already reportedly shelled out at least $9 billion for, and which will reportedly cost another $2.5 billion to cancel, has been tossed on the scrap heap. According to Bolden, things weren't really going that well anyway. Currently, Bolden said the five-year-old Constellation program is burning through billions of dollars and falling further behind schedule. The program couldn't get American astronauts back to the moon until at least 2028. So as much as we would not like it to be the case, the truth is that we were not on a path to get back to the moon's surface, Bolden said. Taking into account that the Constellation program was begun in 2005 and that the Apollo program allegedly landed men on the moon in a mere eight years, it would appear that it wouldn't actually take twice as long to get back to the moon with today's technology as previously advertised, but would actually take at least three times as long. If that is, we were able to man up and follow through with the plan, which obviously isn't going to happen. But be assured that that's only because we don't have the money. Otherwise, we totally would have made it back to the moon, possibly in less than 20 years, by which time all the technology that we know and love today will be as obsolete as pagers and Betamax video recorders, and trips to the moon will still be something that we only talk about, sometimes nostalgically, as we fondly recall the fabled glory days from a decade few will remember, and sometimes with an eye to the future, an oft-promised future that never seems to arrive. In May of 1966, after spending five years working on the Apollo project, we were just a year and a half away from the launch of the first Saturn V. In 2010, after spending five years working on the Constellation project, NASA has nothing to present us but a hefty bill, which just goes to show that that lack of technological sophistication and spaceflight experience can apparently be easily overcome with a little determination and a couple of rolls of duct tape. I was thinking, by the way, that if the idea of an Apollo reenactment were properly pitched to the right reality television producers, we could probably make it back to the moon in just a year or so. There was quite a bit of Apollo hardware that was left over after the sudden demise of the program, much of which is now in various aerospace museums, and aerospace museums tend to be run by aerospace geeks who would like nothing more than to see the U.S. triumphantly return to the moon. It shouldn't be that hard then to convince them to donate that hardware for it to be put to use for the purpose that it was originally intended to serve. We're going to need to assemble all our donated hardware, of course, and for that we can turn to the guys at Monster Garage, who should be able to slap it together for us in a couple of afternoons. There will undoubtedly be some missing and or non-operational parts, but that shouldn't slow things down much. We can just give the guys over at American Pickers a call, and they can scour Americans' back roads to find the parts we need, or reasonable facsimiles. Once our reconstituted Saturn V is launch ready, we'll need to select a crew. And the most obvious choice, needless to say, would be Bear Grylls and his cameramen with the moonwalk footage broadcast as a special edition of Man vs. Moon. Unlike girly men like Neil Armstrong and Buzz Aldrin, Bear would undoubtedly show us a few tricks that the Apollo gang never thought of. Like fashioning a shelter out of moon rocks, foraging for the food and water that others failed to find, building a roaring fire despite the lack of both air and combustible materials, and finding several new and creative uses for the urine bags that his predecessors tossed aside as space trash. He could also probably design and build his own lunar rover from parts salvaged from artifacts of the Soviet Luna program. And he could probably do it all without the need of a spacesuit. Speaking of spacesuits, just a week before NASA canned the Constellation program, the agency announced that it had awarded a contract to Oceaneering International and the David Clark Company to design and build a brand new state-of-the-art spacesuit for use on future manned missions to the moon and beyond. And this is from an article entitled NASA's Next Spacesuit, published in Technology Review, January 25, 2010. If NASA returns to the moon in 2020 as planned, astronauts will step out in a brand new spacesuit. It will give them new mobility and flexibility on the lunar surface while still protecting them from its harsh environment. The space agency has awarded a $500 million, six and a half year contract for the design and development of the Constellation spacesuit. Astronauts performing EVAs these days currently use something known as the extravehicular mobility unit. It has a hard upper torso, layers of material to protect astronauts from micrometeoroids and radiation, a temperature regulation system, and its own life support and communication system. The EMU weighs over 300 pounds and has limited leg mobility. 
Astronauts' feet are normally locked in place on foot restraints while performing extravehicular tasks and during Apollo missions, which used a different EMU suit, astronauts were forced to develop a bunny hop to traverse the lunar surface. I could, of course, point out once again the absurdity of it taking about four times as long to develop a spacesuit now than it did back in the high-tech 1960s, but I'm pretty sure I've already beat that particular horse to death. I could also point out that the Apollo suits somehow managed to perform all of the duties of the current EMUs while weighing about 40% less, but that's also taken a pretty severe beating. So instead, I'll focus on the contention that the Apollo astronauts were, quote, forced to develop a bunny hop to traverse the lunar surface which, as an alert reader pointed out, flies in the face of numerous past claims in which it was maintained that the, quote, bunny hop was found to be the most effective means of locomoting in a reduced gravity environment. Not that it was something forced upon the astronauts by the limitations of the spacesuits. If I remember correctly, one of the Mythbusters propagandists claimed that he had verified that it was the most efficient means of moving in reduced gravity, and he was, by his own admission, wearing a costume and not a pressurized spacesuit when he conducted his experiment. Someone, it would appear, is doing a little lying here. I am, needless to say, as shocked as all of you. When we went to the moon the first time, we were just trying to get there. Now astronauts need to be able to explore the surface, harvest resources, and do science, says Daniel Barry, vice president of research and development at David Clark Company and head of the Constellation Spacesuit Project. So the Apollo missions, it turns out, were just about getting there. And the reason, I guess, why we allegedly flew men to the moon eight times, including the alleged flybys by Apollo 8 and Apollo 13, was to prove that getting there the first time was no fluke. Sure, we were told that the boys were sent there to do science and that they took along a bunch of scientific testing equipment and even, on the last flight, an actual scientist, but that apparently wasn't really the case. And the lunar rovers allegedly flown to the moon were not brought along to enable the astronauts to, quote, explore the surface and conduct additional science projects. This time, however, we're going to do it right. In another 20-plus years, that is, if we fast-track it. What resources, by the way, are we planning to, quote, harvest? We've already allegedly brought back numerous samples of moon rocks, which appears to be about the only resource readily available, other than the water NASA now claims can be found there. How much does it suck, by the way, for NASA to have to cancel the Constellation program right after the agency had reported allegedly discovering loads of water on the moon? One debunker claim that has been made fairly frequently over the years, it should be noted, is that NASA's alleged moon rocks contain no traces of water, proving that they are not of earthly origin and could have only come from the surface of a waterless sphere like the moon which isn't, NASA now claims, waterless. I have no doubt that those same debunkers will be able to come up with some convoluted, hackneyed explanation for the apparent discrepancy. Pictured below is the evolution of the American space suit. From left to right in the top row are the Mercury suit in 1961, the Gemini suit in 1965, and the pre-Playtex Apollo suit 1968, and the lower row are the famous Apollo Magic suit in 1969, the first space shuttle suit in 1981, and the new suit being produced for the now-defunct Constellation program. Below that, believe it or not, is an early prototype Apollo suit. While it may appear to be a still from some 1950s sci-fi flick or a computer-generated artist's conception, it is, in fact, an actual suit being tested in the Mojave Desert in the mid-1960s. Pretty safe to assume that it didn't pass the test. Another thing Bear Grylls would undoubtedly do is bring us back some of those dazzling lunar starscapes that the Apollo guys neglected to capture. Presented below, by the way, as one of NASA's former astronomy picks of the day, and it's linked here, it carried with it the following explanation, quote, If you could turn off the atmosphere's ability to scatter overwhelming sunlight, today's daytime sky might look something like this. Below that is a shot from deep space, illustrating that stars in outer space maybe aren't really as camera shy as some would like us to believe. According to Bolden, NASA had, quote, focused so much of our effort and funding on just getting to the moon, we were neglecting investments required to go beyond. So while we still don't have the money required to get us back to the moon, you see, we do have the money to bypass the moon and fly our guys to more distant locales, like Mars. No target date have been set, but I'm guessing that if we focus our attention on these bolder objectives, we'll probably succeed by, like, 2050, or maybe 2060, or 2069, on the 100th anniversary of the first alleged moon landing. 
As will be recalled, we set our sights a little higher in the 1960s. When Kennedy delivered his famous declaration back in May of 1961 that we were going to the moon, he gave the aerospace community less than a decade to make it happen. Engineers across the country who were well aware of the fact that the nation hadn't even taken its first baby steps yet were understandably dismayed. The first Apollo contract was awarded just two months later in July of 1961 for the sophisticated navigation system that would allegedly guide the spacecraft to the moon. In an unusual move, NASA opted not to solicit bids for the guidance system. Instead, the contract was handed directly to MIT, generating immediate controversy, as noted by Moon Machines. Quote, there was actually a budding industry out there that had developed guidance systems, and people from industry were quite upset. They felt that they should have been given the chance to bid on the contract, and a university is not ordinarily what the government contracts out to build hardware for operational systems. There was, alas, nothing ordinary about the Apollo project. The man NASA turned to first, long before awarding any of the other Apollo contracts, was one Charles Draper, who ran MIT's instrumentation lab, which would later carry Draper's name. Draper was generally described as an eccentric, charismatic, colorful gent whose background was in physics and, curiously, psychology. He is widely considered to be the father of the inertial guidance system. Perhaps significantly, Bill Casing, the first Apollo skeptic to gain prominence, has claimed that it was MIT, in conjunction with DARPA, that provided NASA with the blueprint for how to plausibly simulate manned trips to the moon. If true, then it of course makes perfect sense that NASA would have turned directly and immediately to MIT and would have done so without taking any outside bids. Until MIT completed their work and provided the space agency with an outline of the project, it would seem NASA wouldn't have known what other contracts to award. The fact that the project landed on the desk of Charles Draper is perhaps significant, given that the name is a rather notorious one in 20th century American history and one that is closely tied to the name Bush. It is a name that appears more than once on the membership list of everyone's favorite society, Skull and Bones. It is a name that was prominently featured in the American eugenics movement, with General William Draper Jr. serving as the founder and chairman of the Population Crisis Committee and vice chairman of the Birth Control League, as Planned Parenthood was originally known. General Draper, a close friend of the Bush family, also helped finance the 1932 International Eugenics Conference. Many years later, during the Apollo era, Draper advised LBJ on population reduction strategies. The Draper family was also, not too shockingly, involved in the financing and maintenance of the Nazi regime. General Draper joined Dylan Reed in 1927 and for many years was tasked with personally handling the account of Nazi industrialist and financier Fritz Tyson. At the close of World War II, Draper was appointed Chief of the Economic Division of the Joint Allied Control Council for Germany. He was, in other words, the man who was supposed to oversee the economic denazification of Germany. Just months later, in October 1945, Draper reported that the German economy had magically been denazified. Needless to say, nothing could have been further from the truth. One final note about General Draper, whose son, Bonesman William Draper III, served as the chief of fundraising for George Bush's 1980 presidential campaign. He was a member of the Society of American Magicians. In other words, William Draper Jr. considered himself to be something of an expert in the art of illusion. According to Moon Machines, Draper and his team got to work on the Apollo guidance system in the spring of 1962. Given that Moon Machines also contends that the contract was awarded to MIT in the early summer of 1961, the question that is naturally begged is, why, with the clock ticking and with an absurdly short time frame to pull the Apollo project together, would the MIT team have waited almost a year to get started? Or did they, in fact, spend the first year working on their real assignment, mapping out the key elements of the simulation? If so, then they apparently spent a fair amount of time viewing an obscure German silent film by the name of Die Frau im Mond, The Woman in the Moon. As noted in the painfully long documentary, what happened on the moon? The German feature film released by filmmaker Fritz Lang in 1929 provided the blueprint for the heavily ritualized launch procedures that were adopted for the Apollo program. As can be seen in the screen caps below, all of the elements were there. The unnecessary vertical construction of the spaceship in a specially built hangar the grand opening of the massive hangar doors, the excruciating slow rollout of the upright rocket ship from the hangar to the launch pad, the raucous crowds watching the spectacle live, the now ubiquitous countdown, even the shedding of the two stages of the ship. In other words, the only elements of the performance that the public ever actually witnessed were all lifted directly from a 40-year-old silent film. Fritz Lang's technical advisor on the film was Ehrman Oberth, considered to be one of the three founding fathers of rocketry. 
Assisting Oberth on the film project, according to the previously quoted Time Life book, To the Moon, was one of his brightest students, 19-year-old Werner von Braun. A decade and a half later, Oberth and von Braun would be scooped up through the paperclip project and brought to America to work on, among other things, the Apollo program, whose choreography just happened to very closely match that of the fake moon launch Oberth and von Braun had crafted 40 years earlier. The Fra im Monde, by the way, is not the only Fritz Lang film that proved to be rather prophetic. He followed it up in 1931 with M, the tale of a sadistic, pedophilic serial killer guided by voices in his head. I wonder how he came up with that plot line. Before moving on, I should probably point out here that yet another brazen lie the debunkers like to tell, the one that holds von Braun was only a Nazi because he had little choice in the matter, what with living and working in Germany during the days of the Third Reich and all. That's a nice little fable, but it is contradicted in a big way by at least one known photograph in which von Braun can be seen adorned in the elite Nazi regalia of the Black Order of the SS. Anyway, returning to MIT, the starting point for engineers was to develop a gyroscope-based guidance system. The problem, though, was that the gyros could not be produced to MIT's exacting standards, resulting in gyro after gyro being rejected. Another problem was that translating data from the gyros into flight instructions would require, as Moon Machines noted, a modern digital computer, and putting such a beast in a spaceship was an entirely new challenge. Computers in the early 1960s, you see, were huge. The idea of squeezing such a monster into a spacecraft seemed preposterous. But that wasn't really going to be a problem since, as we've already seen, clearing seemingly insurmountable obstacles was something that the aerospace community was uniquely skilled at in the 1960s. The engineers working on the onboard computer utilized an entirely new technology known as the silicon chip. The technology was so new, though, that no one knew what it could actually do. And as with the gyros, it proved to be nearly impossible to produce chips of acceptable quality. At the time, quote, software was virtually an unknown concept. As Moon Machines duly reported, with nobody clear on exactly what the computer should do, the software engineers were free to write about almost anything they liked. One of those flight software developers, Alex Kosmala, made the following remarkable admission. There were no specs. We made it up. And it's always been amazing to me, why was I allowed to program something that hadn't even been specified, but that would be critical in assuring the success of the whole Apollo program? I couldn't believe it, but that's the way it was. We made it up as we went along. I'm going to take a wild guess here and say that NASA probably wasn't unduly concerned, since the functioning of the software would only have mattered if the agency was planning to actually send guys to the moon. The most complicated aspect of the Apollo missions was the landing of the lunar modules, which made the software program controlling that part of the mission the most difficult to design. Amazingly, though, that aspect of the software design was not assigned until after most of the other programs were two-thirds complete, and it was assigned to a 22-year-old gent named Don Isles, who had just recently started his very first job. According to Moon Machines, quote, the program without which it would be impossible to land on the moon had been written almost as an afterthought by a junior engineer. By mid-1966, Draper's team of controlling the entire mission via an onboard computer had been dropped in favor of an Earth-based control system, with the Draper system along as a backup. MIT allegedly produced a computer the size of a small fridge, which both the command module and the lunar module were outfitted with. Despite the overwhelming obstacles faced by the MIT team and the seemingly lackadaisical approach taken with the project, the Apollo guidance system, as would be expected, performed nearly flawlessly on every outing. One final note here on Diffra et Monde before wrapping up this installment. The gatekeepers over at the Bout Forum appeared to be in on the joke, and that's B-A-U-T Forum. Why else would the site's logo contain not an image of the NASA lunar module sitting on the surface of the moon, but rather a rocket ship that looks suspiciously like the spaceship from Lang's film?
Let's jump right in. It's a journey we can't repeat with today's technology, but in 1969, a group of astronauts risked everything to walk on the moon. When we left Earth, Discovery Channel, 2010. Let's start this final, for now at least. Apollo installment off with a quintet of extremely rare, previously unreleased Apollo mission photos. In the top row, from left to right, we get a good view of the sophisticated gyroscopic navigation system, followed by a shot of Neil Armstrong about to step out of the capsule to take those historic first steps on the moon. And then an eerily familiar shot of a camera set up on a fake lunar surface in front of a fake lunar backdrop. In the bottom row, we learn that an explosion in the ship's oxygen tank has seriously threatened the mission of Apollo 13. The preceding images are, of course, yet more screen caps lifted from Difra Imand, that remarkably prescient silent film that featured the work of technical consultants who would later work on the Apollo missions, the same missions that, quote, we can't repeat with today's technology, though I'm assuming that we could probably put together much better simulations. America's first spacemen, the Mercury 7 astronauts, weighed an average of just 164 pounds each. They were nevertheless considered full-grown men. The average three-man Apollo crew, therefore, probably weighed in at just under 500 pounds. Nowadays, that same three-man crew would probably weigh in at closer to 800 pounds. In addition, they would probably take roughly twice the volume of food and water rations that were needed in the 1960s, and much larger fecal collection bags. Speaking of fecal collection bags, by the way, Buzz and Neil purportedly left a few of those behind at the fabled Tranquility Base. I mention that bit of trivia only because those bags now are, and as hard as it may be to believe, this is absolutely true, well on their way to being declared National Historic Landmarks. The state of California, ever the trendsetter, got the ball rolling in January by declaring those excrement bags to be state, quote, historical resources. Four more states are expected to follow suit by year's end. Due to international treaties declaring that no country can lay claim to real estate on the moon, you see, Tranquility Base itself cannot be declared a historic landmark. So California's Historical Resources Commission, in its infinite wisdom, decided to declare that all the artifacts allegedly left behind are now, quote, historical resources. This is said to be a first step towards the site being declared a national landmark and, ultimately, a United Nations World Heritage Site. The list of protected artifacts includes, specifically, human excrement bags. Seriously. As read in an article entitled, Apollo 11 Excrement Claimed as Historic by California. Technorati.com, January 29, 2010. The concern, it is claimed, is that future lunar explorers, either from other nations or on privately funded missions, will run roughshod over the historic site, looting the valuable artifacts. The message California wants to send to such potential hooligans is that bringing home a souvenir sack of astronaut dung will be treated just as harshly as, say, snapping off a piece of the Great Barrier Reef. So if someone reading this should have the good fortune to be the first space tourist to visit Tranquility Base, please do the right thing and cordon off the area. Maybe post a few signs informing people of the status of the artifacts. And as tempting as it may be, please refrain from bringing home a bag of astronaut dung as a souvenir. As the state of California realizes, the astronaut dung was left there so that it could be enjoyed by everyone. And while it would undoubtedly look good on your fireplace mantle, fecal matter is best viewed in its natural habitat, just as Buzz and Neil left it. I'm also pretty sure, by the way, that this is the first time that a movement has been underway to bestow historical landmark status upon a site that existed only in our minds and on TV screens. Should our next goal be to have Mayberry declared as a UN World Heritage Site? In other news, Aldrin is in full agreement with NASA's plan to scrap the Constellation program and focus on low-Earth orbit flights, with an eye to sending men to Mars at some unspecified time in the future. According to Buzz, who couldn't see stars from the moon, which may be why he didn't have much luck dancing with them, quote, getting long-range spaceflight right requires getting near-Earth orbit perfect. Just as deep-sea exploration began with practice in our littoral waters, a successful Mars mission begins with near-Earth orbit testing. To get to the final stage, we must perfect all that we'll need for the journey. From an article entitled Trading the Moon for Mars, New York Times, February 25, 2010. The first question that comes to my mind, obviously, is when did Aldrin, I'll paraphrase, become concerned about such things? We obviously didn't have low Earth orbit anywhere near perfect in 1969, but that didn't stop him from allegedly blasting off to the moon, which I would think would qualify as a long-range spaceflight and exactly how much near-Earth orbit testing will be required to perfect all that they'll need for the journey. Back in the good old Apollo days, if I recall correctly, we didn't need to send so much as a single man Saturn V into low-Earth orbit before allegedly sending one all the way to the moon. Buzz's old sidekick, as it turns out, begs to differ. 
According to Space.com, Armstrong blasted NASA's new plans for future space exploration. The United States is risking losing its role as a leader in space exploration with its new plan, Armstrong said, adding that he was concerned with the looming gap in American human spaceflight. Fellow Apollo astronauts Jim Lovell and Eugene Kernan are also unhappy with the change of direction. Speaking before a Senate subcommittee, Kernan had this to say, quote, We, Armstrong, Lovell, and myself, have come to the unanimous conclusion that this budget proposal presents no challenges, has no focus, and is in fact a blueprint for a mission to nowhere. From Obama's new space plan, poorly advised, May 12, 2010. Kernan and his fellow Apollo astronauts, needless to say, know a little more than the rest of us do about taking a mission to nowhere. And now, with that out of the way, let's turn our attention to UFOs and aliens, the flying saucer kind, which figure rather prominently in some Apollo conspiracy theories. One such theory holds that we did indeed make it to the moon in the 1960s, only to encounter either active alien colonies or artifacts of past alien colonies. As the story goes, we were either scared off or warned off, and have therefore never returned. These theories generally hold that the early Apollo missions succeeded, but that the later ones had to be faked, because we were, you know, scared to go back and piss off the aliens. We can only hope, by the way, that the moon's resident aliens have little interest in human fecal matter and have therefore left Buzz and Neil's historical resources untouched. The other predominant alien theory, which often appears hand-in-hand -hand with the first, seems to be that we did indeed make it to the moon, but not with the ridiculous hardware of the Apollo program. That was all for show, you see, to cover up the real technology that was used, which invariably is said to be the technology that was retro-engineered from the recovered alien spacecraft that Mulder and Scully kept hidden out at Area 51. Both theories, in other words, posit that we did indeed send men to the moon, though the home audience was lied to about the details of the missions, specifically how we got there and or what we found there. Some of these theories go so far as to say that there are artifacts of alien colonies on Mars as well, and or that Mars has already been secretly colonized by us Earthlings. One of President Eisenhower's granddaughters, for example, has been making the rounds lately, claiming that she was targeted for some sort of ongoing Mars colonization project involving all kinds of exotic technology that is in the hands of various secret societies, or something like that. The details aren't really important. Many of the folks who tell such tales also like to claim that it was NASA itself that seeded into the conspiracy literature the notion that we never made it to the moon. Better for the skeptics in the crowd to buy into that scenario, so the story goes, than to figure out the truth that our moon has been taken over by hostile aliens, or whatever other equally dubious alien theory it is that is being promoted. To anyone with a working brain, of course, it should be perfectly obvious that it is actually the opposite that is true. That it is, in fact, the alien theories that pose the least threat to the status quo. For two rather obvious reasons. First, the alien theories generally hold that we did actually send men to the moon, so they pose no direct challenge to the core lie of the Apollo program. Additionally, these theories contain deliberately outlandish elements that are designed to marginalize conspiracy theories and drive most sane people away from not only Apollo theories, but from the entire field of conspiracy literature. Anyone who has spent time in the conspiracy trenches should recognize a very obvious pattern, and one which is certainly not unique to Apollo. A substantial body of solid research on what really happened on September 11, 2001, for example, has been tainted by the deliberate introduction of such inanities as pod planes, holograms, and particle beam weapons. Compelling evidence of the existing of elite international pedophile rings, on the other hand, has been marginalized by blending in stories of shape-shifting alien-human hybrids. And so it goes. While we're on the subject of aliens, I'm sure that it was just a coincidence that Eric von Donneken's Chariot of the Gods was released just a month before the alleged Apollo moon landing, and then relentlessly promoted into runaway bestseller status. Chariots and its sequels have reportedly sold in excess of 60 million copies. The book, which purported to present evidence of alien visitations in days of yore, firmly planted two ideas in the minds of many readers. The first being long-range space travel was not only possible, but it already occurred, and the second, that aliens were already around us, keeping an eye on the planet. Interestingly enough, some of America's illustrious astronauts have themselves seeded the literature with alien tales. Not many of them, to my knowledge, has ever endorsed the notion of alien colonies on the moon, but they have certainly added fuel to that fire by dropping allusions to UFO sightings. Our old friend Buzz Aldrin, most notoriously, has claimed that Apollo 11 was tailed all the way to the moon by a UFO. Why do you suppose it is, by the way, that the debunker crowd seems to have little to say about the UFO tales told by American astronauts? After all, these very same debunkers nearly go into cardiac arrest whenever a conspiracy theorist such as myself either implicitly or explicitly calls into question the integrity and honesty of America's virile astronauts. But if we're supposed to accept as truth everything that they have to say about their alleged lunar missions, then doesn't that mean that we necessarily need to embrace their claims about UFOs? Those stories are, after all, part of the package. 
If the debunkers are so sure that our astronauts can be trusted to tell us the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, then why do the debunker sites not trumpet the existence of UFOs that were allegedly witnessed by their knights in magic space suits? Let's back up now to 1962 to review a bastard stepchild of the U.S. space program known as Operation Fishbowl, which was without a doubt one of the most ill-conceived operations ever undertaken by the Brain Trust in Washington. In a nutshell, Fishbowl was a series of rocket launches aimed at detonating nuclear weapons at high altitudes. Why? Washington is rather coy about that, but I'm sure that they had perfectly valid reasons for conducting high-altitude nuke tests. A number of the rockets powering those flights failed, one quite spectacularly and devastatingly. Four of the launches succeeded in reaching altitude and detonating, but those successes came at a price, as we shall see. Most of the warheads were mounted on Thor rockets, similar to the one pictured below. All were launched from Johnston Island in the Pacific, because we've always found bucolic islands in the Pacific to be really good places to do nuke testing. The first warhead, codenamed Bluegill, was launched on June 2, 1962, but the radar tracking system failed and, with no way to verify the rocket's trajectory, it had to be destroyed in flight. The second warhead, Starfish, took flight on June 19, 1962, but the rocket failed after burning for just under a minute and the craft once again had to be destroyed in flight. Missile debris, some of it radioactive, rained down on the island and the surrounding waters. A couple of guys were dispatched with brooms and dustpans, and the project was quickly resumed. The next launch on July 9, 1962, was the first to succeed. It was also, according to some theorists, the one that was supposed to accomplish a key goal of the program, blasting a hole through the Van Allen radiation belts to hopefully allow for safe passage of the Apollo spacecraft. Starfish Prime, a 1.4 megaton nuclear warhead, detonated at an altitude of about 250 miles. If theorists are correct about the Prime objective, the test failed miserably. Instead of punching a hole through the belts, the blast actually created an additional man-made radiation belt. It also damaged as many as nine U.S. and Soviet satellites, six of which failed within months of the test, and it caused electrical damage in nearby Hawaii. The next attempted launch, which was apparently undertaken because, as should be obvious, the program was going so well, failed on the launch pad and the Thor rocket exploded, causing extensive radioactive contamination of the area, as well as the destruction of the launch pad. The spectacular failure of Bluegill Prime on July 25, 1962, necessitated a brief break. The launches resumed on October 15, 1962, with a third attempt to launch the Bluegill warhead. That test, Bluegill Double Prime, failed when the rocket went into a serious tumble not long after taking flight. It was, once again, destroyed in flight. Next up was Checkmate, just four days later. Checkmate detonated at an altitude of about 91 miles, considerably lower than the previous success, and with a smaller payload. The next launch was the fourth attempt dubbed Bluegill Triple Prime. Not many years later, of course, we would get much better at that whole rocket launching thing, despite the fact that the Saturn V's F-1 engines were notoriously unstable, eliminating the need for such flights as, for example, Apollo 12 Double Prime. Bluegill Triple Prime detonated on October 25, 1962 at an altitude of only 30 miles. I think we can probably all agree that getting an unmanned rocket to an altitude of 30 miles in just four attempts at the very same time that the manned Mercury missions were allegedly attaining low Earth orbit on every launch, was quite a stunning achievement. In any event, the last of the fishbowl launches was on November 1, 1962, dubbed Kingfish, and it detonated about twice the altitude of the previous blast, and so ended a largely forgotten corollary of the U.S. space program. Moving on, I happened to stumble upon a couple of fascinating articles on Space.com, and by fascinating I mean that they unintentionally raised questions about the legitimacy of the Apollo missions, as so frequently happens whenever NASA types talk about going back to the moon. In one of the articles we find Michael Wargo, identified as the chief lunar scientist for exploration systems at NASA headquarters, contemplating a return trip to the moon. Quote, None of our spacesuits we currently have would be appropriate for that extreme of an environment, says Wargo. Any materials built for Earth-like temperatures won't work on the moon. They don't bend anymore. They fracture, and they fracture brittily. And so everything gets extremely brittle at those temperatures. From an article entitled, Water Discovery Fuels Hope to Colonize the Moon, November 13, 2009. And so we discover that there is yet another piece of 1960s technology that has now fallen into an all-consuming black hole. Non-brittle materials from which to fashion spacesuits suitable for lunar exploration. Back in the day, it will be recalled, Playtex's bra seamstresses knew a thing or two about stitching together a non-brittle spacesuit. In the same article, Jack Burns of the Center for Astrophysics and Space Astronomy at the University of Colorado Boulder and director of the Lunar University Network for Astrophysics Research claimed that, quote, We only went to the moon six times and we didn't even go to the most interesting places on the moon. There's so much more to discover about the moon just from a scientific perspective. 
what it can tell us about the formation of the Earth. So what's that story again that the debunkers like to tell about there being no compelling reason to go, quote, back to the vast wasteland that is the moon? Who am I supposed to believe here, the guy with all the fancy academic titles, or the guys whose primary area of expertise seems to be mastering the art of self-flagellation? The other article from Space.com details yet more of the lost technology of the 1960s. Quote, Though engineers are well on their way to preparing us for life on the moon, some major issues have yet to be resolved. Something we'll have to consider is radiation. Zachney with Honeybee Robotics, a NASA contractor, said, quote, We can close ourselves in habitats, but radiation protection requires a lot of shielding. We cannot solve this problem yet. Radiation can kill us. Moon dwellers will also have to contend with the ubiquitous dust on the surface of the moon, which gets into everything and can wear down joints and connectors and prevent sealing off doors. It also poses health risks to people as it can cause breathing difficulties and is difficult to filter out of habitats. From How to Build Lunar Homes from Moon Dirt, September 3rd, 2008. The radiation problem has already been covered both here and elsewhere, so let's focus instead once again on the dust problem. As previously discussed, NASA nowadays acknowledges that dealing with lunar dust will require the development of sophisticated new technology. No explanation has been provided, of course, for why the Apollo astronauts didn't have any problems with the dust, despite allegedly venturing out on multiple EVAs during their alleged missions. During the alleged Apollo 17 mission, for example, our fearless astronauts supposedly took the moon buggy out on three separate occasions, returning each time, by their own accounts, covered from head to toe in moon dust, which they necessarily would have brought back into the lunar module with them, and then ultimately transferred to the command module when the supposed docking later took place. Why then is there no mention in the Apollo literature of any health problems arising from this, or of any problems with the delicate instrumentation, or of any problems with the door seals? If it is, quote, difficult to filter out of habitats, even with the technology we possess today, then how were we able to do it 40 plus years ago? The debunker crowd, despite loudly proclaiming that they have thoroughly debunked every conspiracy claim that has ever been made, has had nothing to say on this issue. I wonder why that is. Seriously, I really do wonder why that is. It would be understandable if there were some requirement that their debunkings have some actual merit, but their body of, quote, work clearly demonstrates that they are not bound by any such restrictions. So the silence is a bit puzzling. Before signing off, there's one final point that needs to be addressed here, one that has been on my mind since first undertaking this series. It's generally claimed, as previously noted, that getting to the moon from low Earth orbit is a relatively straightforward procedure. You simply accelerate enough to slingshot out of low Earth orbit, thus escaping Earth's gravitational pull, and then just sort of free fall to the moon, firing the engines every now and then to make minor course adjustments. That all sounds just fine in theory, until you take a step back and realize that the moon itself is a satellite of the Earth, held in place by, you guessed it, Earth's gravitational attraction. So I guess the obvious question that is begged here is, when exactly is it, when traveling from the Earth to the moon, that one leaves Earth's orbit? The answer, quite obviously, is never. Earth's gravitational pull would obviously get progressively weaker the farther out one ventured, but common sense dictates that it wouldn't just abruptly end once you got beyond low Earth orbit. Indeed, an article that appeared in various newspapers not long ago noted that the satellites that enable GPS devices to work orbit the Earth at an altitude of roughly 12,000 miles, 11,800 miles beyond low Earth orbit. And yet they are, miraculously enough, still held in place by Earth's gravity and there have been no reported cases of one of them suddenly free-falling to the moon. There would come a time during a journey to the moon when that body's own gravitational attraction would be stronger than that of the Earth. But given the relative masses of the two bodies, that time wouldn't come until the tail end of the trip. You could conceivably freefall most of the way back, but you would first, of course, have to actually get there. I guess what I'm trying to say here is that I'm not really buying into the claim that you wouldn't need much fuel to get to the moon after reaching low Earth orbit. Logic would seem to dictate that the path to the moon would not be the largely linear one that we've been sold on, but rather a series of steadily increasing circles, probably ellipses actually, requiring the expenditure of considerable amounts of fuel. Perhaps that is the reason why the space shuttle has never done a lunar flyby, or left low Earth orbit for any other reason. Of course, there are also the problems posed by space radiation, and extreme temperatures, and micrometeorites, and re-entry, and... Riding on a spaceship
much again. Uh, thank you for your time. Have a good flight and uh, many more exciting experiences on the road. Thank you a lot. jump right in to part 14. I know, I know, a lot of you were expecting and have been waiting somewhat patiently for, and have probably even been promised, a new installment of the Laurel Canyon series. And I will readily admit that I did say that, with the launch of the last Apollo installment, that I was done with this topic for now. But how was I supposed to know that just four months after that launch, it would be announced, albeit so quietly that most of us probably missed it, that we will be boldly taking another stab at sending men to the moon? As I noted in the last Apollo post, whenever NASA types talk about going back to the moon, they invariably seem to unintentionally raise questions about the legitimacy of the Apollo missions. And sure enough, the boys over at Lockheed Martin, one of NASA's longtime partners in crime, certainly didn't let me down in that regard with this latest proposal. I should probably first clarify here that the proposed missions are not so ambitious as to actually involve landing on the moon. No, these proposed missions involve merely flying to the moon's far side and then sort of hanging out in lunar orbit for a couple of weeks. In other words, all of the most technologically demanding aspects of the alleged Apollo missions, like actually landing on the moon, surviving on the moon, lifting off from the moon, and docking while in lunar orbit, have been eliminated. Even these far less ambitious missions, of course, won't actually happen. But let's play along while Space.com's Space Insider columnist Leonard David fills us in on what we have to look forward to. In a piece entitled, Mission Proposed to Send Astronauts to the Moon's Far Side, November 23, 2010. Quote, While NASA has officially given up its plans to send humans back to the surface of the moon anytime soon, a contractor is proposing the mission to send a crew to a stationary spot in orbit over the far side of Earth's neighbor. Lockheed Martin has begun pitching an L-2 far side mission using its Orion spacecraft under development. The Earth-Moon L-2 Lagrange point is where the combined gravity of the Earth and the moon allows a spacecraft to hover over one spot and be synchronized with the moon in its orbit around the Earth. From a halo orbit around that L-2 point, a crew would control robots on the lunar surface. Teleoperated science tasks include snagging rock specimens for return to Earth from the moon's South Pole Aitken Basin, one of the largest, deepest, and oldest craters in the solar system, as well as deploy a radio telescope array on the far side. Everybody got all that? Sounds pretty easy, doesn't it? After all, the bar has been set substantially lower than it was in the glorious 1960s when we easily mastered such things as landing men on the moon, walking on the moon, driving dune buggies on the moon, and playing golf on the moon. Nevertheless, there are some potential problems, just as there are, as is usually the case, some aspects of these proposed missions that directly contradict the entrenched, though slightly insane belief that we sent men to the moon back in the days when telephones were heavy enough to be used as lethal weapons. Let's begin with one of the stated benefits of these proposed missions as listed in a Lockheed Martin white paper and laid out by Daniel Bates of UK's Daily Mail in an article entitled Astronauts to be Sent to the Far Side of the Moon for the First Time in 40 Years in Pre-Mars Mission, November 25, 2010. Quote, Both NASA and Lockheed Martin would also have the chance to address the problem of a higher re-entry speed which is accumulated on trips farther away from the Earth. There they go again, pretending as though we've never done this before. Already we've heard from the NASA types about how we haven't yet solved the radiation problem and how we haven't yet developed spacesuit materials capable of withstanding the temperature extremes on the moon and how we haven't yet solved the problem of how to deal with all that lunar dust. 
And now we find that we apparently also haven't yet worked out how to deal with the fact that spacecraft returning from the moon would have to survive much higher re-entry speeds than spacecraft returning from low Earth orbit. And I'm guessing that we also might have a problem with controlling the all-important re-entry angle. At this point, I'm really beginning to wonder if there isn't any of that classic 1960s space technology that hasn't been lost. Another problem arises from the proposed duration and timeline of the missions. According to Space.com, quote, each flight would prove out the Orion capsule's life support systems for one month duration missions. Later in the same article, we find that on each mission, our fearless astronauts, quote, would orbit the L2 point for about two weeks. It would appear then that Lockheed and NASA are allowing a full two weeks to travel to and from the moon, which would be all well and good were it not for the obvious fact that it's roughly twice the time that it took for the mighty Apollo craft to allegedly get to the moon and back. The 1960s was, as some will surely recall, the era of muscle cars, so perhaps it was the era of muscle spaceships as well. But since we have now apparently sacrificed raw power in favor of fuel economy, I guess today's spaceships just don't burn rubber like the spacecraft of the wild and woolly 1960s. Though there is, I suppose, an alternative explanation. The last 40 years of space research has taught us that it would actually take twice as long to get to the moon as was believed back when we faked the Apollo flights. According to Josh Hopkins of Lockheed Martin, in order to achieve the company's not-so-lofty goal of sending men out to orbit the moon, the company's Human Spaceflight Advanced Programs Division has, quote, come up with a sequence of missions that they've named Stepping Stones, which begins with flights in low Earth orbit and incrementally builds. Lockheed views the first Orion missions as, quote, feasible by 2016 to 2018. Do I really need to belabor the point that, back in the days when mankind was transitioning from the use of stone tools, we didn't need any stepping stones to get to the moon? The very first manned launch of an Apollo craft allegedly flew its crew all the way there and back without a hitch. And do I also need to once again point out that, despite setting our sights much lower, and despite having vastly improved technology to work with, and despite having an additional 50 years of spaceflight experience, it will still take just as long to get men near the moon as it did in the 1960s to actually walk on the moon? Returning now to the alleged benefits of running these missions, we find that Lockheed's white paper also talks about being able to, quote, measure astronauts' radiation dose from cosmic rays and solar flares to verify that Orion provides sufficient protection, as it is designed to do. Currently, the medical effects of deep space radiation are not well understood, so a one-month mission would improve our understanding without exposing astronauts to excessive risk. So despite the fact that some 43 years have now passed since we first allegedly sent men into deep space, we still really don't know anything about the effects of deep space radiation, but we're pretty sure, apparently, that a 30-day dosage is a good, safe place to start. NASA initially considered for the Apollo missions, according to To the Moon, a Time Life book, quote, men doomed by fatal disease. One final curious aspect of these latest proposed missions that we need to delve into was explained by Space.com, quote, the robotic lander and rover would be launched first on a slow but efficient trajectory to the moon to ensure that the rover is on its way before risking the crew launch. Say what? Are you kidding me? What kind of girly men are these new breed of astronauts? Stepping stones? Supplemental launches before risking the crew? Can't we just find some men like John Glenn and Alan Shepard to pilot the Orion craft? And what is this nonsense about a slow but efficient trajectory to the moon? Efficient? In what way? Last time I checked, the debunkers were still claiming that getting to the moon was pretty much a matter of just free-falling your way there. What could be more efficient than that? Oh wait, I remember now. As I pointed out in the last Apollo post, getting to the moon does not actually involve free-falling. It involves battling the Earth's gravity by flying in ever-increasing ellipses and burning lots and lots of fuel. And Lockheed's oblique reference to a slow but efficient trajectory is in fact a confirmation of that. And so, by the way, is this artist's conception of the proposed Orion missions, which shows the spacecraft outside of low Earth orbit, and yet clearly still burning its engines. Following the launch of the lander and the rover, both of which, it will be recalled, stored easily aboard the Apollo flights, quote, three astronauts would be launched in an Orion spacecraft. If NASA has built a heavy lift launch vehicle by then, it would be capable of launching the crew directly to the moon. If that mega booster is a no-show, small rockets can be used instead. But a more complex arrangement would be required. First, Orion would be launched to low-Earth orbit on a rocket such as a Delta IV Heavy. Then a modified Centaur upper stage would launch on a separate rocket. Orion would dock to the Centaur stage in orbit, and the Centaur would boost Orion toward the moon. To briefly recap then, we know that getting three men near the moon in modern times is considerably more difficult than landing three men on the moon was in ancient times. It now requires taking a number of baby steps before taking the big plunge, 
and it requires the launch of three separate high-tech spacecraft. And it will take the astronauts a full week to get there. The equipment, of course, will take even longer to get there because it's on a slower and more efficient course. And we may have some problems to work out in regard to deep space radiation and re-entry speed. And even after all that, we won't actually be landing men on the moon. That would probably require another 10 years of baby steps and the launch of at least five spacecraft. And since we'll be checking out the far side on these proposed missions, we still won't be able to verify all those Apollo artifacts supposedly littering the moon, which is really kind of a moot point because we won't actually be going at all. Speaking of the far side of the moon, by the way, the Daily Mail noted that the surface was first photographed by Luna 3, a Soviet probe, in 1959, and then the Apollo 8 mission followed in 1968, but there has been scant exploration of it since. Translation? There has been no exploration of the far side since 1959, and it would be nice if the Daily Mail would throw in a comma now and then. But enough of that. Let's move on to a different topic. Remember how I argued that if it were possible to send crews to the moon, private enterprise would probably have a strong financial incentive to have done so to exploit any available resources? And remember how the debunkers not surprisingly claimed that there was nothing much on the moon to see or do? So there was really not any really compelling reason to go back? Well, as it turns out, and this is quite shocking, that the debunkers may be lying once again. As the LA Times reported on April 8, 2011, in W.J. Hennigan's Moon X aims to scour moon for rare materials, quote, a team of prominent Silicon Valley entrepreneurs are shooting for the moon with a new private venture aimed at scouring the lunar surface for precious metals and rare metallic elements. The private company Moon Express Incorporated, or Moon X, is building robotic rovers alongside scientists at NASA's Ames Research Center, northwest of San Jose. Moon X's machines are designed to look for materials that are scarce on Earth, but found in everything from a Toyota Prius car battery to guidance systems on cruise missiles. While there is no guarantee the moon is flush with these materials, Moon X officials think that it may be a gold mine of so-called rare Earth elements. The company won't, naturally enough, be sending any human cargo to the moon, because that isn't really possible. But the point here is that there are, in fact, compelling reasons for return flights to the moon for both financial and scientific gain, so there is no validity at all to the argument that no one has been back for some 40 years simply because there's no reason to go back. Let's briefly now return to Operation Fishbowl, which was also discussed in the last Apollo offering. Unbeknownst to me until very recently, NPR decided to dredge up the nearly 50-year-old high-altitude nuke test less than two weeks before I did. In a piece by Robert Krolwich entitled A Very Scary Light Show, Exploding H-Bombs in Space, July 1, 2010. And the facts they brought to the table were rather compelling. Quote, if you're wondering why anybody would deliberately detonate an H-bomb in space, the answer comes from a conversation we had with science historian James Fleming of Colby College. According to Fleming, who has been busily reading through James Van Allen's papers while working on a biography, quote, a good entry point to the story is May 8, 1958, when James Van Allen, a space scientist, stands in front of the National Academy in Washington, D.C., and announces that they've just discovered something new about the planet. What Van Allen's team had discovered, of course, was that Earth is ringed by belts of high-energy particles, known as the Van Allen radiation belts. And what Fleming's recent research revealed, incredibly enough, is that the day after the press conference, Van Allen agreed with the military to get involved with a project to set off atomic bombs in the magnetosphere to see if they could disrupt it. Let's pause here for a moment to reflect on the almost unfathomable level of megalomania at play here. Immediately upon learning of the existence of the radiation belts, the military intelligence complex decided, without even giving it much thought, that it would be a great idea to attack said belts with atomic weapons, and the scientists who had made the discovery immediately agreed that that was a swell idea. As Fleming noted, this is the first occasion I've ever discovered where someone discovered something and immediately decided to blow it up. Never mind that the belts were there to shield the planet from incoming space radiation, and that their existence is one of the primary reasons that biological life forms can thrive on this sphere. Let's just see if we can blow a big hole in them. It apparently never occurred to the geniuses in Washington that if you blow a hole in the belts to, say, allow for the safe passage of spacecraft, you would also presumably allow for the unsafe passage of massive amounts of incoming and very lethal radiation. This, dear reader, says a lot about the true nature of the men who rule behind the curtain. What hubris is required to put at risk every living creature on this planet, and to do so without even giving it a second thought, for the dubious purpose of facilitating space missions that were never going to actually take place? And bear in mind, by the way, that these tests took place during the tenure of a nearly mythical figure known as John Fitzgerald Kennedy. For those who are not inclined to believe that the sitting president actually calls the shots, I would suggest taking a little time to contemplate why it is that the man who many consider to have been a knight in shining armor was the man who gave the thumbs up to the most recklessly arrogant nuclear weapons program tests ever conceived. 
The first such tests were conducted in 1958, almost immediately after the discovery of the radiation bands. But those tests used just lowly old atom bombs. And according to NPR, quote, atom bombs had little effect on the magnetosphere, which is why in 1962 the powers that be decided to up the ante by using hydrogen bombs. Really, really big hydrogen bombs. How big? Starfish Prime, the most successful of the tests, was tipped with a warhead 100 times as powerful as the bomb that leveled Hiroshima. As detailed by NPR, quote, the plan was to send rockets hundreds of miles up, higher than the Earth's atmosphere, and then detonate nuclear weapons to see, A, if the bomb's radiation would make it harder to see what was up there, like incoming Russian missiles, B, if an explosion would do any damage to any objects nearby, C, if the Van Allen belts would move a blast down the bands to an earthly target, like Moscow, for example, and most peculiar, D, if a man-made explosion might alter the natural shape of the belts. The scientific basis for these proposals is not clear. Objective A roughly translates to, we had to do it to protect ourselves from those crazy Ruskies. Those with atypically long memories may recall that the collapse of the international communist threat neatly coincided with the rise of the international terrorist threat. That was pretty much the all-purpose excuse for all manner of heinous activities undertaken by the Western powers. The main problem here, though, is that Starfish Prime was detonated at an altitude of 250 miles, which is 50 miles beyond low Earth orbit. And I'm reasonably certain that Soviet ICBMs weren't designed to fly at anywhere near that altitude. Moving on to B, I feel fairly confident in saying that even back in 1962, at the tender age of two, I could have provided an answer to that question, and the answer would have been, yes, detonating a very large hydrogen bomb will cause extensive collateral damage. Proceeding to C, I'm afraid I'm going to have to respectfully disagree with NPR and its decision to label D as the most peculiar. Attempting to take out Moscow in a nuclear holocaust redirected through the Van Allen belts has to rank up pretty high on the peculiarity scale. And what would be the point? Plausible deniability? Looky what just happened to Moscow. It's as if God himself struck a blow against the evil empire. I know we didn't do it. As for D, altering the natural shape of the belts appears to have been the primary goal. Because as we all know, man can always improve upon the natural order of things. And it was immediately apparent, right from the time of their discovery, that the shape of the belts was entirely wrong for this planet. Sure, they would have been fine for, say, Mars or Venus, or even Pluto, before it was rudely kicked out of the fraternity of planets, but they were clearly unfit to circle this planet. So we had to try to fix them. Luckily, we failed. And with that, I'm really now over my Apollo obsession. See you all back in Laurel Canyon.